Hello, I am Devi from Thespo and today I have with me two super talented storytellers. Uh, we have Gauri Bhuyan who is a performer and when she's not a theatre maker, she's doing psychology and uh, she was at our very own Tapri uh, as well. Um, and we have with us Anahita Sachdev, who is a media practitioner and works in the um, in media and she's also worked with archiving stories before. Let's just get straight into it. So, see, oftentimes one kind of story gets more focus, more center of attention, is told many times, but some stories they don't and they and they sort of get, you know, hidden somewhere and, they, and then they're not told as often. And what happens sometimes with this is that there is a danger of building a singular story, like how Chimamanda Adichie also mentioned in her TED talk, I think if you've seen it, danger of a single story. And so I'm wondering how can we as performers, as story consumers, as storytellers, how do we promote that multiple narratives, that multiple versions get sort of equal, equally out there and we hear all different kinds of narratives rather than just one. Um, so I was reading something very interesting about like singular storytelling and like the dominant narrative uh, and it kind of draws back to the Foucauldian concept of, um, I think he called it the hegemonic hegemonic narrative if i'm not sure is basically uh, the dominant narrative which is then considered as the prevalent knowledge system so let's say right now um uh, not right now maybe before this there was brahminical literature and uh, that was predominant and there was a predominant understanding of everything our value system our literature our morals in the country but then you started having, let's say, Dalit literature, which kind of made its own niche. And it was important because it's important for people who are the, um, how, what's the word, are the subaltern, for them to write their own narratives. And, that's, and that, I think, is very important. I think um, as people with a certain amount of privilege, uh, it's important as allies to step back and allow the subaltern or the other, uh, quote unquote, to take and get the space to be able to tell their own stories. I, I don't believe in the idea of, let's say me as an upper middle class, het, het cis, um, cis het woman, uh, telling the story of someone who's either from the LGBTQIA plus community or someone who's, let's say, um, a, a, from the Dalit community, because I don't think it's my story to tell. And I'm not doing their story justice by saying it for them. What I can do as someone with privilege is step back and say, sure, this is my stage and I want you to use it and use it as an opportunity to tell your story because you are the only person who can tell your story and do it full justice. Um, so I think that is very important in developing multiple narratives and um, it's very interesting because, you know, when I was talking about uh, reading literature as a child, I read a lot of English literature, like very British literature. So I read a lot of um, classics. I read, read a lot of like David Copperfield, Great Expectations and stuff like that. And that's the kind of stuff like my mom's Bengali. They are the biggest victims of the colonial hangover. So um, I was made to read all these classics and I was absolutely in love with Enid Blyton and like, Famous Five, Nancy Drew, I loved all of it. But I never saw myself represented in any of these stories because I was a brown Indian girl and a lot of what was happening in these stories was not something I could relate to. I couldn't relate to going on an adventure or like going paddling in a boat in a river because like Bombay. <laughs> and it's really interesting because I think it's very, very important for children, especially young girls, to see themselves represented in the literature they read because that opens up the way to possibilities and which is why I think having multiple narratives is so important like now you now have more like feminist versions of Disney story tales um, you have like black princesses and it's so important to be inclusive because you know I, I, I have a disability and for me I have never once in my life read let's say a romantic novel or any novel with the protagonist who has a disability. 
um, and and that then makes me think that I can't be represented in literature. If literature can't represent me, then who can? And that's why I think multiple narratives are so, so, so important. Yeah, I agree that there were some very uh, important, significant points that you raised because um, it's that is the process of undoing the biases that have been set in all our stories for centuries, right? It could have started all the way back in, say, colonial time. In fact, even before that, right? When we had, say, Greek travelers who come to India and then they want to write stories in very, very narrow ways in which India has to be this land of mystical creatures where, like, there are golden ants and, like, some strange stuff. A lot of strange stuff, yeah. And so, um, and the tradition of storytelling then, and that is, like, semi-academic storytelling, right, is that you have to take over from what somebody else has written before you. And that is how you build legitimacy. You say that, okay, X, Y, Z before me wrote India is a land of blah. So you have to refer to that and then build more on it. And so for centuries, um, someone with that kind of privilege or power could use that to build a narrative about India. And we did a project about this in like college, which is too long ago now, but uh, it's still fresh in my head, right? Which was about how do those tropes and those mechanisms of storytelling emerge in like music videos about India now? And these are music videos based in the West. So me and my uh, friend, we did like an analysis of, of these videos and we say, okay, if we need to represent our country, we still have the same similar kind of stereotypes in our head because you cannot possibly um, know all stories. So you just want to do the convenient thing and say, okay, condense it all. India is a land in which like you'll have like these uh, naked priests and like we are poor, but we are happy. That is the trope. That is the repetitive kind of thing we use. Right. So those are the things to question. So I definitely agree with Gauri that we make spaces for people who have been oppressed to come and tell their stories, be it like, um, people who are from the transgender community, let them talk about their issues, uh, be, be it persons with disabilities, uh, be it uh, people who've been oppressed in terms of caste, definitely we need to make those spaces and we need to keep critiquing the stories we've been already told and, and look at them from different perspectives and not just fall for whatever is convenient. So I remember um, I was part of a I've just done a few theater things. So one of those was uh, in which um, this, it was a dance drama and it was the Ram, a retelling of the Ramayana, but from a feminist perspective. So the perspective of the women and how they were impacted through the Ramayana. And I had to play the character of Urmila, who is Lakshman's wife. Nobody yeah. even knows that he has a wife. Okay, so obviously our identity, unfortunately, at that time is associated with who you're married to and what they're up to exactly so imagine that it is an uh, exile for him and he gets all the glory of it but what about the woman who's equally in exile um and so um does her con does her choice or her opinion anything ever get featured in and same about say if we're talking about the ramayan what happens after say ravan is defeated um there is this film called sita sings the blues which um is really cool it's by an animator in america um so it's not come <laughs> you know naturally from india but it was someone who related with the story of the ramayan and she said that okay how you relate to the ramayan and you say that okay we went through these tribulations as sita i was abducted i was harassed I, there was so much anxiety then i came back and i had to give this uh, test Agni Pariksha to prove I was pure and she said all my life I have only been dedicated to this one man and um, look at this like after all this drama this is what happens after you know and then she she burns herself and that's it that's the end of her life and uh, that's just so tragic but nobody talks about it nobody talks about that perspective or what that reflects on you know how much we respect these narratives uh, so definitely our job also I think should be to keep questioning uh, questioning our own privilege, but also questioning what all we've inherited as like a dominant narrative. I think that's so true, but because it also kind of ties into the idea of like collective memory and counter memory, right? Collective memory as what we've been told are just the are just plain beliefs that have been kind of passed down from generations based on the kind of system in which, let's say, our ancestors lived. So if our ancestors lived in a patriarchal world, which they did, where let's say caste-based uh, segregation of society was very prevalent, it still is today. Um, we got we've got told the stories a certain way, right? And that's why it's really important to then generate counter memory, which is develop 
alternate versions of that story so we can see it from our perspectives because i remember uh, when we were studying history every history class our teachers would remind us that history was is always written by the victor it's only the person who wins the war that's the perspective from which the from which history is written and so it's really important to take a pause and be like what do you think happened to the ones who lost and what what did they think of history as it was written and set in stone because stories i don't think can be set in stone in that sense <laughs> add one more point which is like a which is like prob- problematizing uh, you know all these things which is great that we need to create spaces for people who don't have a voice to get a voice right um but how do we stop it from being like tokenistic and how do we stop it from being like naam pe you know doing mm. it people are doing it uh, and examples that come to my mind are mostly from pop culture in which we say um that if you see a show from america which most of us do right uh, yeah. how there'll be like a token representation of somebody with color or like <laughs> an indian person there or um, whatever like they'll say ha ye dal diya ya fir if you look at say mm, this show called uh, what was it never have i never ever never have i ever it's about an indian girl i actually never ended up watching it so uh, what, did you did you watch it did you i did i watched the whole show yeah what so it was supposed to be like okay representation of this this new culture whatever but how do you stop it from being tokenistic how do you stop it from being reductive and uh, which perspective should it come from so i mean definitely it's important to bring out those stories and it does get credit for doing that um, but you can have another layer of questioning and like yeah creating problems but you know like with never have i ever i also think like by like completely agree there were certain things that were really jarring for me uh, i had to stop for a minute and kind of reconsider diasporic experience of indianness and my experience of indianness as someone who's lived in india all my life and for a lot of uh, the diasporic community in different countries this is exactly how they are they are very let's say quote unquote tokenistic because they are trying so hard to kind of cling on to whatever little semblance of culture they have in a foreign country so i mean like i i, I get what the whole issue with never have i ever was but i also think the experience can be looked at with a, if you looked at it from a different perspective has a certain nuance to it i think in our entire conversation we've spoken a lot about the sort of historical uh, storytelling how stories sort of come to us right now and how we can from the present day critique them or look at them in a different way so let's go back to that part of how they come about to us so there have been stories that have survived uh, through the oral medium so we have the oral storytelling traditions through which we have the stories that have been passed down generations they have survived till today and we also have the written stories that have survived uh, till today as well um so my question is then sometimes do we end up privileging the written stories as let's say more credible whereas the oral as more like ritualistic traditions you know we sort of classify them as that and so how how do you think this written and oral traditions of storytelling work and in especially in relation to each other and how we perceive it when we look at them now so uh, what what do you all think about that um i i definitely think um written stories are obviously not obviously but like due to convention given more uh, importance and considered quote on quote factual um but i think that also stems from our treatment of the content and, how, and the medium with which medium through which it is passed down right for example let's talk about archives and sanayat has worked with um you know the 1947 archives so um you know like for example when it comes to archives and like documenting uh, um uh, let's say subaltern experience since we've been talking about it it's often considered unofficial because word of mouth or interviewing is like the, the method of an interview is not considered official enough which is why very often we have to write it down and therefore document it and put it down in history so that it uh, remains as evidence for the generations to come but what we often fail to recognize is the fact that writing and uh, let's say we're writing online is not something that's completely accessible to a lot of people in the country and therefore the only way they can then pass on their stories is through the oral medium 
um, which is why I think, I mean, of course, there's a predominance of um, uh, predominant reliance on uh, uh, written stories. But I think one thing that could definitely help make oral stories uh, more credible per se would be by, let's say, making it a formal system of storytelling. And I think that's just one of the ways we could probably look at um, officializing, uh, if I may, uh, oral storytelling. Um, I think those that's very interesting. And uh, the question itself is like a vast question. Um, there is this thing in which the process of recording history is there's this thing called historiography, which is about um, what are the angles that get into how a story is recorded. And like you said, Gauri, that history is only written by the victors, which is definitely true, that there is a power balance, which is always in place. And uh, um, some of it is matter of convenience to say you can't possibly tell the stories of a thousand people. So you just tell like two and then you go with it. <laughs> but other than that, um, I think that our, our process of overturning that can also be about changing our perspective, um, which is like tough, e easier said than done. Um, anyway, I, I, maybe if we take a minute to, uh, I can take a minute to reflect on my work with the archive, right? The 1947 partition archive. Um, and so the uh, effort of the archive is to say, we are running out of time to record these first person narratives of people who've seen this huge, huge thing that happened in the Indian subcontinent. And, uh, um, and those stories are getting diluted. Like our generation has different sets of trials and tribulations, but it's unimaginable compared to what they went through. And so um, there are some dominant narratives that we hear about partition, about uh, how India was divided. And then uh, um, it will again have that power balance, that victor and the defeated kind of angle. Um, and I think oral history gets in, becomes important here because it gives you those little perspectives which nobody kind of knew. For instance, um, say someone will say that, say a community, someone from the Hindu community versus someone from the Muslim community. So there will be people who will say, okay, our communities have had tensions for centuries. But do you get to hear those narratives which say that, no, we've not. We've been neighbors. Uh, our families used to love each other. We used to eat at each other's houses. And then some very unfortunate things happened, which changed the course of that forever. Those are two very different perspectives, but they're both equally valid. And so how do we uh, give credibility to them if we don't record both? So you're totally right that we have to give legitimacy to some kind of oral traditions um, by recording them, by talking about them, uh, and by ha archiving them in this way. And then there's other forms of oral traditions which need not be about some very big events. It could just be how like life is passed down. So um, oral traditions in, say, a place in Rajasthan, maybe in Karnataka, um, where uh, even in the Northeast, apparently, uh, in Nagaland, I think, uh, uh, there was a time when nobody used to write. And so uh, traditions were passed down orally. That was just the way to do it. And so how have we changed our perspective on it? And why have we given legitimacy to written history? Can we po possibly go back to saying all these histories are valid? Uh, yeah, so it's a lot of undoing, like an erasing of how we think. Uh, but I think it's, it, it's important to try. Um, yeah. And moving forward from here, how we sort of, how we uh, record our stories. Is it important to then consider if we are going to pass on our stories orally or in the written format and what impact that's going to leave? Like, for example, theater has a lot of performance. And if the performance, let's say, is not recorded, it just stays in the memory of the person who's seeing it. And it's not necessarily, you don't always have to have a hardbound script when you perform. Uh, so how, how are you looking at, looking at the way forward of dealing with this um, collective memory of either oral storytelling or written storytelling? I don't think there is any infallible way of storytelling. I don't think it's ever going to be possible uh, theoretically or practically. <laughs> practically to completely transform my memory of an event to let's say my kids or my grandchildren. But what we can attempt to do as a generation that understands the importance of multiple narratives 
is then allow the future generations to see all sides of the story and let them decide which one they kind of wish to you know maybe not side with but understand and i think that is very important because you know when even as storytellers even as um uh, let's say for example if my parents were telling me a story there was a very marked difference between the way they did it because my mom is uh, she she does believe in god for instance my dad on the other hand was atheist and even small things like that kind of affect the way you story tell because that's where reflexivity comes in and your own biases and prejudices come in so as as much as you think you're being very objective you're not you know at some point so i think the maximum we can do is offer them multiple perspectives to the same narrative uh, offer them multiple mediums through which to communicate their stories and understand the stories of the previous generations and kind of integrate that and make their own phenomenology as they so wished because i i don't think there is any way we can completely and like 100% transfer our stories to them and i don't i don't even think that's how it should be right like for example when you were talking about the script i think that's the beauty of theater also right live theater that the only thing that then remains as let's say the artifact of a performance is the script and very often let's say like for example in devised plays we don't have scripts then what do we do um but that's the beauty of it because then let's say how let's say how macbeth was performed 20 years ago is would be so different from how macbeth is performed today and I, that that's how we kind of evolve with time so yeah i think that's a brilliant way to put it to say that uh you make sure you give a space to all those narratives and let other people make of them whatever they would uh which is very valid and i think that definitely is the way to go unfortunately um now i think with with the internet and with uh more spaces for uh, written and documented uh, kind of history it's like a bigger um force which which is uh, against other forms of history which are just like which don't have so much technology on their side which might not be uh you know so um accessible which might be in a language which very few people speak uh, or or it could be something that doesn't get documented by an expert and so there is no space for it to go um and so i think that uh, it's definitely important to like i said rethink um why we give importance to only these documented histories um and i think one more thing we can uh, possibly do is be aware of our own biases and uh, uh, realize that whoever is recording history does not uh, have any authority necessarily does not have any uh, unbiased authority over that subject um always come with that disclaimer always come with that pause um and always keep thinking critically so i think that is a change that's happening in the indian education hopefully you know with this new education policy and god knows when it'll get implemented but like, <laughs> you know, uh, but it's, it's an attempt somebody is making that attempt or for for instance we've had like a, a an education in which we've been fortunate to be have given the space to think and ask these questions so how can we make sure that other people have those faculties uh, have those what do you call it? infrastructure those systems to keep questioning uh i think those are the we can ensure but like you said there is no infallible way of telling a story because there's no one story anyway so also i think it's very important to uh, it's very important to not know things you know like people are often scared to say i don't know what you're talking about but it's really important to because it's the only way we're ever going to be on the same page about things right or or else like one person will be talking about something and we'll have no idea and that's where like the whole miscommunication and gap and discrepancy happens so i think it's very important of uh, of course as anita said to question and also to acknowledge that it's okay if you don't know something that probably everyone else around you knows you know maybe it'll give them another perspective of seeing what they took it for granted as a norm so yeah yeah in fact what you said uh, brings me to an reminds me of another point which is that uh, again because of the internet or because of how technologyified our lives are now uh, it's so easy to not go ahead of what you have in front of you like whatever my instagram feed will give me i'll just be like ha huh, this is, is it 
Yeah. It will give you what you already see and what you want. An echo see. chamber, yeah. An echo chamber. And so do we make that effort to say, okay, I didn't know this. Let me find it out. Or, or let me talk to somebody whose views are not the same as mine. Let me read a literature from, which is not from the 21st century or which was not written in English, which is translated. Um, so I think that we have to keep making those efforts. And like you said, be okay with saying, I don't know this because it's a world of stuff we don't know. Unfortunately, yeah. it's so easy to just be in the echo chamber and spend your time in it. You don't need to be curious anymore. Like you don't need to spend your time being curious because you have so much else. Uh, but it's a battle to like keep it going, I think. Should be. Yeah, that's, I think what the points that you both have mentioned are really, really significant as to not to be trapped in that echo chamber, sort of move out of it and give yourself space to hear everyone out even if you if you, even if your views don't match or you are like on the opposite ends it's okay to give half that space to sort of let both of them be you know present in the same sort of area so we've spent an entire good amount of time talking about stories talking about how they survive generations talking about what we want uh, in them to move forward and about different ways to story tell so I think it'll just be, it'll just fit right if we end with why, why is there this need to tell stories? I think it's, uh, it's a very human, a very primal need for connection. Um, you know, uh, I don't know whether you've studied the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but um, one of the needs is the need to belong. And uh, very often what happens is that, especially when we talk about communities that are oppressed, they feel like they're being singled out because that is what the dominant narrative tries to do. But the moment you start listening to stories that are similar to yours, you feel like, okay, there are other people in the world who are going through the same things and they're fighting and they're still going ahead with life and it's possible to do that. And I'm not alone in what's happening to me. And I don't think, and I think that's not just limited to let's say the, um, the the understanding of oppression as it is but it's also i think extends itself to things like life right um when when do we feel like we uh, we've watched a good film when it's taught us something about life something about death so showing us life in a perspective we've never considered before and i i think that's the beauty of storytelling it's about articulating what's going on in your head in the only way we really know how to, right? Because otherwise, how would we ever tell each other what we're thinking? I think about it, like if, if all of us were, we didn't have the power of like language and speech, how would we work as a society? Um, and of course, this extends itself to different mediums. It's like different media of storytelling. So it doesn't have to be with words. It could be with art, it could be with performance, it could be with mime, what have you. Um, but I think the idea is to like connect, engage and feel like you belong somewhere. It gives you a sense of identity. So I, I think that's, I, for me, I think that is the beauty and power and reason why we storytell. That's beautiful. That, that's so well put and well articulated. Um, definitely. Agreed, agreed. I almost don't want to add because like, it was, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to throw some two cents in there, which is, I was going to say the same thing about connection. And uh, I think that's what it comes down to. Uh, um, saying anything that is more than just functional. So you could just say, I woke up and I, whatever, like I eat breakfast every day. But if you say, okay, today I woke up and like I ate breakfast earlier than usual. That's it. That That is itself like, a stupid story but it's a story right so anything that is more than functional information uh, in any form would be some form of storytelling which means we do it all the time we we do it uh, uh, when we gossip we do it when we write music we do it when we watch movies we talk about movies we when we and theater especially of course um, so we're doing it all the time uh, so as to communicate like you said what is going on in our head to someone else um, it could be through sign language. It could be through, uh, it could be, yeah. So I'm just going to list like a, a never ending list of things. So there's no point. <laughs> that. Um, 
I, I think uh, right now we have so many advantages of uh, say crossing barriers of language, crossing barriers of geography, and to see uh, that what we are going through is replicated in like lots of other parts of the world, and that is also storytelling. So, for instance, if India is going through protests, uh, which it was last year, which shook up the country, right? So is say Hong Kong. So is say Brazil. So is Poland. So is so. What is t- bringing us together? Um, and uh, how are we giving meaning to each other's experiences? Life is tough, and stuff is not okay most of the time. So how are we using other people's experiences to give power to what we are going through, or or to just power through basically, um, or to or it need not be as seminal as that. It could just be like today I am bored doing nothing. what movie did i watch and how did i entertain myself so the so i think it's just to le- lead a life which is more than functional you need storytelling and uh, that is the beauty of it uh, i think that was just beautiful and a beautiful way to sort of come for entire conversation to come together because we we it, we in itself took a journey of about stories from the past the present where we want to be and i think it it sort of created a connection here as well between the three of us yeah because i could completely relate to what you guys were saying and i thought that was a beautiful conversation thank you so much for being here for doing for having this great conversation and and talking about something that we all love which is stories so thank you thank you so much gauri thank you so much anahita for your time thank you thank, thank you for calling us <laughs>